How does a character arrive for screenwriters? Is it something that's very vivid in their mind, like almost this is a real person, even if it's not? Or is it a hazy, vague thing that develops over many drafts? I think it, ultimately it's going to depend on the writer. And I've known writers that work, they have a great character, and they just want to see what kind of uh, circumstance would be right for this character uh, to explore. In fact, Frank Daniel used to say that you could see um, a story as like a scientific experiment where you take a known substance and an environment that you know and you put them together and see how they react, uh, find out what, what happens. You want to find uh, a character. Some people will go with that first. Okay, this great character, what kind of circumstance would challenge them the most, make them explode, basically? Um, and, but most people tend to come up with a story, I find, first, and then they explore, well, what kind of character can, can that be, um, uh, would work for my story that I have. And um, in terms of how ri different writers work, um, I, I, I know some writers will base it on a person they know, and sometimes that's very useful. Um, and uh, the advantage of that, even if it's the, the person they know has nothing to do with that kind of story, is that you can get real specific because you know the character, you know you know that how they are, and you're not gonna they're not gonna they're capable of some things, they're not capable of other things. Uh, um, but uh, so, um, but I've been in a situation where I based a script on a person who was in the story, and then at the end of the draft, I was like, that's not the right person for that story. So I wound up going through I call it a major characterectomy. <laughs> Change the. I bet that hurt. Right. Well, actually, it worked out in the end. Oh, good. Okay. Um, but uh, so, yeah. So different writers have different processes. But the the key for me is uh, make it specific as you can. You don't. I do have students who'll say, uh, "Joe, nineteen is uh, a typical freshman." It's like there's no typical freshman. There's no typical anything. Everybody's a little, everybody's unique, and you look for that. Um, but uh, so, yeah, that's, that's been, been my experience of it. What about the science of connecting to character? Right. That is, um, again, something that, that we dedicate a chapter to. Um, one term that gets used that I think can limit imagination is the idea of a hero. A hero, uh, we talk about the hero's journey, and then people say, well, if I got a hero, the connotation of a hero is someone who's heroic, someone who's likable and does brave things. That's not necessarily what's meant by the hero's journey, but that's the connotation that people have. And the fact is that people tend to like to watch people with flaws, and you don't want to uh, eliminate that. You have people that aren't necessarily admirable. In fact, uh, one theory we talk about, uh, 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 I believe a psychologist named uh, Jonathan Gottschall has a book on this, is that, um, that we watch characters who are flawed because we learn from them. Um, that, that uh, again, quoting, uh, I can get you the exact psychologist who said it, uh, he said uh, that stories are flight simulators for life. Like, you can uh, a flight simulator so you can make mistakes and not die. And a story is watching other people make mistakes so you can learn to not do those things. And so it's the question of, does your character have to be likable? Well, the answer is, it's, it's all about what's called the primacy effect, first impressions. If they're, uh, the example of uh, J.P. McMurphy, okay, he, in the Cuckoo's Nest, he, how likable is someone who's committed statutory rape, who uh, gets into fights all the time and is in jail and slacks off and doesn't want to work, just wants to play cards? You tell someone, no, I got this character, you're going to say, I don't want to spend time with that character. That's who he is. But when you first meet him, he's not doing those things. When you first meet him, he's like being released and he's like whooping it up for joy. And then he's out there hanging out with people and trying to encourage people and looking at their cards and things. So our first impression of him is that, and that allows us to bond with him. And then, as the course of the story, we get to see 
his flaws come out and how they play into the circumstance. Um, that movie um, in Bruges is the same thing. You know, you have a, a, a character who's uh, who's a hired killer and he killed a little kid uh, by accident, but he still he killed a kid, and now he's he's wondering what to do. But you don't know that <laughs> when you first meet him. He's like a a little boy complaining that he's stuck in this place looking at museums, and there's a dark side to it. But we get to know him that way, and then we gradually learn about him, and by then we're on his side. So, um, but the question of connecting to a main character is what exactly happens? We talk about it again in that book. There are different theories. Um, there is this idea, of course, that you like a character, so you sympathize with them. But there's also a theory that you, you become the character, that you literally go through a process uh, that one theorist argues is the basis for morality, that you go through the process where you can feel the pain that the other person feels. Like uh, the example given is a person decides, a woman decides he's going to murder the old man next door, and then imagines what it'd be like to be murdered, and then imagines that they are the one being murdered, feels the pain, and says, no, I'm not going to do that. So that you, it's more than just liking a character, it's actually a process by which you merge and become uh, emotionally connected. There's another, I don't know if we talked about this in the book, but there's a, this notion of mirror neurons too in the brain, that, the, that looking at a chocolate pie, what, looking at someone eating a chocolate pie fires the same pleasure neurons in your brain as you eating it. So that you, that's not settled science, I guess, yet, but there are strong connections that, that audiences make with, with the character that allows them to go on this journey and, and purge themselves you know, of emotion, as Aristotle said many years ago. Um, and I think it's a, this, this poses a challenge, oddly enough, for virtual reality. Because virtual reality, a few years ago, they were really struggling to come up with a way to make it a mass consumption product like a hit, like you have Jaws or Star Wars, or at the movie theater, you'll have a similar thing going on with uh, public theater where they're playing, doing something. And the problem with that is that you, when you surrender to a movie character, you're surrendering. You're not there anymore. You stop existing. And you don't have agency. You don't do anything. You're just watching it. And you're enthralled, and you are it. But if you're in virtual reality, you still have agency. You're not the person there. You're actually making decisions. So you're inevitably pulled out of it. And great for a game. I'm, I'm glad they haven't developed them too far, because I'd be addicted, and I'd never do anything but play uh, virtual reality games. It's wonderful, but this process of audience connection with a character, whether it's in movies or a storyteller, um, is, uh, in, involves real close connection, and therefore learning. And you uh, see a character go through what we call character arc. That's when they become consciously aware of something they didn't know before, and that's a lesson they, they have to learn. Or you have a, a tragedy where the character never learns, but we learned that they did something that they couldn't recover from. They didn't learn in time. Uh, or you get something really twisted like Cuckoo's Nest, where the character is heroic and we don't want him to learn. We want him to always be heroic. It's just that it's a tragedy what happened, but something else happened. So there's, there's variations um, on that.